How many of us, I wonder, can see the connection between this and this? Or perhaps this way of expressing things makes it clearer. Do you see the connection now? Not at all. I think I just grew up in a world that none of this makes any sense. Well, inside the big track, there is a small computer which is just following a set of mathematical instructions to tell it to make the five-sided figure. Good evening. What we've been doing is at the centre of the most significant change in education in a quarter of a century. All over the country, children are becoming more and more familiar with computers, whilst at the same time, adults, many of them parents, are becoming more and more confused about what's going on and where it's taking us. It's that kind of question that we'll be tackling in the real world. Science and technology have a powerful influence on all our lives. We'll be looking not only at the new developments and discoveries, but also at the impacts they're going to have on all of us. In this first real world, we're going to examine the growing body of opinion, which says that the imaginative use of computers in our schools will both equip our youngsters for working with them later and help them avoid the fear of maths and numbers which currently plague so many adults. Like many a newcomer to the world of computers, I was sceptical about their real value. Mindless, addictive, divisive, elitist were all criticisms which sprang to mind. And how about their effect on a family? Well, shortly after New Year, we asked 12 families living in the south of England to give a home to a computer, and later we'll be finding out how they've got on. Of course, we've already heard that Mrs. Thatcher has promised that she'll have a microcomputer in every secondary school by the end of this year. We'll be talking with some of those who believe that that is nowhere near a big enough response to the needs of today. And we start our first real world with a visit to a primary school in Maidenhead, where the five-year-olds are already perfectly at home with the computer and the world in which they're growing up. bring to learning is fun. Computers are going into people's homes whether the education system does anything about it or not and so one thing we have to do is to make sure that we're responding to the needs of children as they see them as well as uh, uh, to the needs of children as we see them. Response to the age of the computer has been total at Lowbrook Primary School in Maidenhead. Here the computer is an essential part of classroom furniture even the youngest pupils, the five-year-olds, are as familiar with the keyboard as they are with the sandpit. Suitable educational programs are scarce, so Headmaster Graham Sullivan encourages the older pupils to devise their own software. In Lowbrook, we've got four computers now, soon to be five. The main thing is they learn about computers. They learn how to handle them, they become blasé about the technology. They learn how to control them. Now, if you don't learn to control these machines, they will control you. The infants from five years onwards use our computers and we use them to reinforce skills that are taught by other teachers. So the infants, when they first start using it, just use keyboard familiarization programs. So they get used to the idea of loading a program. And it's quite mind-blowing to find an infant child of five to come in and deal with a machine the adult world fears in such a blasé way as to come along, pick a cassette, load it into the computer and run a program without asking for help. It's um, telling you to type in your name so that it can remember your name, so that it can say, if you get a sum wrong, no, Matthew, so that's not right. And it's just being friendly. The lower juniors start to learn to program. Lower juniors are sevens and eights. And they start to learn to program as well as use the other uh, features of the machine. Seven times one, seven. Matt's asking me, Nine, five, and the other juniors are really getting into programming in a big way. Some of them take off and become very sophisticated programmers by the time they're 11. Well, the idea is, is that you've got a chance to guess the number between 1 and 50 
to see if you can get it right. And in the end, what it does is if you get it right, it makes some sounds and it also says um, how many guesses you've got it right in. The fact that our machine just sits around amongst the children, it doesn't lock, get locked away in a tiny little room. The esoteric world of the computer room is dead. The computer's around, in with the powder paints and the chicken feed. It's around all over the place. So we're using it to familiarize children, but also programming. We don't need software to teach children how to program. Programming in itself may be enough justification for getting a computer into school to see the things run. If you get it wrong, say you put like that. So it gives you a list and shows you exactly what it is. Is the computer any more than just something that you happen to be fascinated by? Do you think it's really essential that the kids have it? If you'd asked me that question ten years ago, I'd have said it's a nice thing to have in school and it's good fun. You're asking me that question in 1982, and in 1982 it's already too late really to start doing this. I think we must get these into schools because society is changing so rapidly now, and computers are initiating that change, and we must reflect that in school. So, why does Graham Sullivan think computers are essential? What exactly are we learning when we play games like this? And how easy is it for a grown-up completely new to computers to understand what it's all about? Simply by following the instructions presented on the screen, Sue and the computer can play Hangman. Her attempt to guess the letters tapped in on the keyboard. And of course, an exercise like this allows the player to practice her vocabulary to exercise word building and if by any chance she gets it wrong only the computer will know actually the word was nasty well it's been fun and I've also practiced some skills I haven't used in a long time teaching children to be computer literate may be a good idea but it's potentially unnerving for many parents two mums who help out at Lowbrook now both have computers in their homes Eileen Little and Pam Q. I think they have the advantage here of the computer as well as the school and therefore they, they are very, very fortunate. The computer, from my point of view, is the visual learning aid which children seem to appreciate as much as the written, spoken learning aid. And I know from my own two children that the visual learning is very important. <laughs> The idea that learning and fun are two different things could finally disappear with the age of the classroom computer. These days computers don't only stand still and do maths, they can help with grammar and spelling and art. Geometry comes alive when you can program a computer to draw on the floor. It's called a turtle. A lot of people of our generation and older probably learnt their maths at school by just being told what to do and they didn't actually experience doing the things that the turtle is doing. They didn't actually have an idea in their mind of what an angle really is. And young children can relate to this little turtle and actually stand and line themselves up like the turtle, look where his eyes are looking, and actually orientate themselves with the turtle and turn the way he's going. So they actually begin to understand that a turning measure is completely different to measuring along a straight line. Why do you approve of the turtle? Well, I think what it does is enable the children to actually get down and look at what they're doing. It helps them to realize that this computer isn't a mysterious box, that they're actually able to tell the robot what to do through what they put into the computer. So, no points now for guessing where the inspiration for the toy we saw at the beginning of the program probably came from. And now, too, we can see how those mathematical shapes and figures are interpreted by the computer-based toy in the hands of someone who knows what she's doing. Elizabeth is six years old, and already she's a practiced hand at programming this unit. Can I hold it for you? Now, what are we going to do? That's a fifth of a circle, yes. done the same thing again. How many times are you going to do that? Five. And what will happen then? The best game it should be. And off it goes around the figure. 
Starting from that point, the geometry also makes sense. Five-sided figure, all sides of equal length, and at the end of each one, a turn through an external angle of a complete circle divided by the number of sides of the figure. So, whilst grown-ups who learned the traditional way might be confused by starting from the mathematical end of the problem, a six-year-old isn't thrown because she can program the simple computer inside this toy. Programming is a beautiful activity. It's addictive, it's a stimulating intellectual exercise, and it, for once in our school career, gives children the idea that to get it wrong first time is a good thing, because debugging suddenly becomes a valuable activity. You look back over what you've done and trace it backwards and see, why doesn't it work? Well, what I am actually trying to do at the moment is to, deb to debug this computer program that so I've made myself. And the only problem with it is that I've got a fault in it, which um, will give you the clues to, I guess, the number, which would be like boiling if you got it two guesses away from it, or very hot if you got it right next to it. And what I'm doing here is this, I'm just um, clearing it so I can list it at the moment. And now, I am trying to find a fault in it to fix. Um, and I think I found one. Did you have any misgivings at all when you first heard that your children were going to be working with computers? Not from the children's point of view, no. I was very pleased that they were been able to use computers. But from my point of view, yes, because when one bought one and put it in one's home and didn't know anything about computers at all, and your child said to you, yes, mummy, I'll show you how to use it, <laughs> one was a bit apprehensive. You don't feel at all threatened? Oh, no, not threatened, because I think you must want for your children better than you had for yourself. I think that being a parent, you must want that. Yes. And uh, that's important. The government has an advisory unit for computer-based learning. Its director is Bill Tagg. I think there's a problem at the moment that uh, computers are going into some homes and they're not going into all homes. And I suppose that there is a danger that this can become divisive. Volunteering to give house room to a computer certainly had a major impact on the lives of our 12 families. After only two weeks in the car home, Mrs Carr was convinced her children were definitely having an advantage that she didn't. I was very bad at maths at school and I would hate my children to grow up feeling the same way about sums that I did um, and I think it will help them to enjoy maths and help them with the technology that they'll need when they're grown up. And the Green family, at first a little sceptical, had also been hooked. Mrs Green unexpectedly so. I didn't really know what a computer was like and I thought well I would like to see how a computer works my son showed us how to play the games and I found I quite enjoy playing the games and the word game in particular I found was quite exciting you'd put in your vowel and you'd hope to form a word and uh, I had quite good results with that which pleased me in the home of the Martin family the three boys had become quickly addicted for them it was more than just fun it is fun but we are learning more about it, so we're learning about computer programming and the logic of the computers and all that sort of thing. I like playing the games. Do you think you learn anything from it? Yes. What? Well, I'm getting better at maths on it. I like Super and Hangman. What do your friends think of you having one? Some no, some don't. They think they wish they had it. And what sort of impact has it had on you as a, as a whole family? Ah, well, it sort of rearranged the family completely. <laughs> really? How? Yes. Well, all the time we would have spent watching television or doing things like that is now spent playing on the computer. I play with it after I've done my homework for quarter of an hour or half an hour and then daddy when we've gone to bed plays with it for quite a long time so i think it's more for the young people um we've always done without these modern things you might say and uh, therefore i think it's more interest to the younger people but i think they're too expensive for the ordinary family to buy well we'd already decided that we were going to buy a computer but the 
the decision was which computer we were going to buy. Will you be sorry if it has to go away? Mm, yes. Why? Why? Well, I miss it very much because of the games and the learning over it. And, well, my mum will be back to the TV again. L is to the left, is it? L to the left, yes, and semicolon makes it go to the right. Do you like that, Mum? Yes. A to the right. And uh, is the F1 to begin? No. Mindless, addictive, money-wasting. Criticism about these kinds of computer games have caused some countries to consider banning them. But Nick Rushby, director of computer-based learning at Imperial College, believes that even the amusement arcade computer games have their good points. I mean, arcades like this, there are a lot of people putting money into video games and their computers, and they're putting money in because it's fun. But in actual fact, they're learning as well. Computers like Space Invaders are being used to help children improve their hand-eye coordination, um, particularly with children who've got problems in this area. The height of ambition when I was young was to have a big Meccano set, because you could build all sorts of things from it all sorts of working models, and you learnt an awful lot. And computers, in many respects, are information construction kits. And with them, children can build things, um, and they can explore models as well, not just in mathematics, but in English, in French, geography, history, um, all kinds of subjects. I think this myth that computers are just for the young um, is just a myth. It's something which we've created over the past two years. Um, certainly, uh, the majority of computers, microcomputers, personal computers, tend to be used by younger people. But that doesn't mean to say that older people can't learn how to use them themselves. My grandparents grew up in a time when there wasn't very much air travel. Uh, they learned about air travel. I don't think that we're scared of computers, but I don't think we yet quite understand their place in society. And I think the problem is that even government doesn't understand the place of computers in society. And so everybody, it's the blind leading the blind right the way through, I think. And this is the problem. One computer in every school is cosmetic. I think it's better than nothing, and we mustn't look a gift horse in the mouth. But we can't think that by getting one machine into a school, we're suddenly fulfilling all the needs of children in 1982. Education, certainly at the moment, has very little money of its own. I don't think we could justify developing microcomputer systems just for education. We have to develop them, or the manufacturers have to develop them, for businesses, for the domestic market. What education needs to do is to choose those products which are appropriate, which it can use effectively. I know the present government is doing some, something towards introducing uh, computer education into schools, but certainly it's not doing enough. And I don't think it's doing enough in terms of uh, educating the public at large to accept uh, many of the attitudes that go with a computerized society. Isn't this going to be divisive, really, that you're producing just some kids that can deal with computers and that you're going to separate them, perhaps, from the rest of the community, the rest of the kids? I think soon, whether schools like it or not, all kids will be using computers in schools. All children, in all schools. And schools can only control that by saying, we won't do it yet. But sooner or later, they will do it. And at the moment, our, our children in our school do it more than other schools who haven't yet got their computers. But if that's divisive, then it's about time others caught up. Well, there we have it. A challenge to Kenneth Baker, the government's man in charge of information technology, and to all of us to come to terms with what these machines can now do for our lives. Or are you still to be convinced? With us on The Real World are some of those families who two months ago were complete strangers to microcomputers. Stuart, you've got a very special programme fed into the computer there. What is it? Well, it's an angelfish that Kevin drew and I animated. It's very pretty, isn't it? The way it sort of opens its mouth and has the bubbles going up there. Was it very hard to do? No, not really. It's just a series of repeated statements which just make the bubbles go up and down. And now you've actually drawn, haven't you, Kevin, another programme since then? Yes. What's that? Subattack. I wonder if you can put that into the cassette there and see if we can have a look at that in a minute. Mr. Martin, um, having had the thing for six weeks, two months now, would you spend the amount of money to have one permanently in your home? I think we would, yes. Why? Um, well, they, they both benefited.
tremendously from the experience of the computer and they're getting on very well with their programming. Is it more than fun? Are they, are they really learning anything? I think they're learning something which will be of great benefit to them in the future. OK, well, let's get back to these enthusiasts then. Have you got your program in? Yes. Can you explain what it does? That one moves you uh, right. That one moves you left. Then you have to try and shoot at the ship above by pressing this one. Got him. <laughs> no, just missed. <laughs> Well, here we have the Isles family. Young Chris is at the keyboard at the moment with brothers Philip and Martin. Mrs Isles, what sort of an influence has the computer been in your home? Well, I think it's taken over, really, um, particularly this week on half-term holiday. Uh, it's been on from before 9 o'clock in the morning right through. And I think we managed to change over to play school by about 4 o'clock in the afternoon. It's, they've, it's all been great fun. They've thoroughly enjoyed having it. Has it been more than fun, do you think? Um, well, I suppose it could be, but we don't really feel we've had it long enough yet to uh, know that it's educational value to the children. I mean, they've just enjoyed playing the games. This last week, they've tried to do something else with it, um, with a bit of a push from us, I suppose. Uh, but Christopher um, has learnt to copy his name and uh, other counting games on it. Is there any chance that now this has to go back to uh, the people who lent it to us? You might consider buying something like this? Well, I think we would consider buying it. At the moment, I think the prices are still too high. The other problem is that the machines are developing so fast, it, it could well be out of date in six months' time. Well, this is the whole family. Keith, how many of your own programmes have you actually made up? I've written about 12. And what sort of things have you asked them to do? Um, they run to um, games and math tests, modification testers, things like that. How about you, Mrs Hall? What impact did it have on the family? Oh, it's caused great interest in the family we, and in, with their friends. We've had all their friends in to have a look and play the games and do the maths programmes, etc. Really? I mean, how much interest was there in, in the neighbourhood about it? Well, we've had to limit the number of friends in the house at one time, so you can see that it has caused quite a lot. This is the Craddock family, and we have to be honest that young Penny has actually spent some time at school with the computer. Was it valuable, Penny, having a computer at home as well? I think so, because you have more time to do what... Well, you don't have time at school, really, to do any long programmes or to do much experimenting of your own. Well, let's hear from Sheila. You were new to the computer. What sort of an experience has it been to you? Well, um, I enjoyed doing the speed typing, but I haven't written any programmes. And really, I do a lot of outdoor activities. And I didn't really find enough time to use the computer properly to its limits. Did you find you were doing things together, or were you always working solo? No, on the whole, I think we felt that it was really rather an isolated um, activity. And perhaps we as a family like to um, get together and discuss things um, as a family and I I do wonder if in the future you know we may find this that people will sit themselves in front of a screen and do their own thing and the art of conversation will to some extent be lost so everyone had a lot of fun but certainly there were quite a number of reservations in fact one head teacher I spoke to said he wouldn't be buying a computer simply because he thought there weren't enough good educational programs available now to make it worthwhile. But if there are any schools or parents watching who think the moment may be right, well, we've put together an information sheet based on the research done for this programme and we'll be happy to send you a copy. Our address coming up in a minute. And one thing you may have noticed is that you can't watch your favourite television programme at the same time as using your computer, a fact we may live to regret. <laughs> but that's a risk we'll have to take, because here on The Real World we are committed to bringing you as clear an understanding as possible of what science is doing to all of us, whether we're that high or that high. Till next week. Good night. Good night.
And before we go, the programme address, The Real World, TVS, Maidstone, ME15, 6NT.